Audrey is on well deserved leave, so she's not here. So I've been deputized to to run the technology at least. And mostly I introduce John Harmon, who will be our teacher for several sessions. So John, thank you. Uh, thank you for coming. Um, I appreciate uh, Audrey's courtesy in referring me to me as Dr. Harmon. Uh, the only people who call me Dr. Harmon are the people at the University of Rochester who want my money. <laughs> so don't think you need to call me Dr. Harmon, please. Okay. Um, I should tell you one little story. <clears throat> I, Audrey sent around a little I uh, me uh, what I was going to talk about. But I should tell you that um, uh, when Claire and I were looking for churches in this area, uh, the Presbyterian Church here in Morristown was recommended. And my wife, who was raised Catholic, said, who are these Presbyterians after all? And because we had attended uh, United Church of Christ churches for years, uh, as a matter, matter, matter of fact, three of them in three different cities, and we were quite comfortable with the culture and with the church. And she didn't know what to expect, and she got here and she said, you know, this is really like the UCC. And I said, well, yeah. <laughs> Part of the point is that, uh, as we're going to talk about in the last session, uh, the name of the de denomination doesn't necessarily reflect what the church is like. Uh, our church in America has become very different from where it started. That's one of the themes that we'll have in the last session. And it's very interesting to see where Protestantism, where religion, Christianity is today in America, or where it's not. So we'll, we'll talk more about that in the session five. Okay? So uh, a, a couple in introductions here. This So these are the five sessions. Uh, today, we're going to talk about uh, Palestine at the time of Jesus. I thought it was important to understand the context. What was the world like when Jesus was there? And how do we know? And we'll talk more about that. There are some challenges we have in understanding what that is, which I'll go through. But it's important that we at least try to understand best we can what Palestine was like at the time. Um, <clears throat> Second, next week, with the early Jesus movement, no, notice I'm not talking about the Christian church here, because the Christian church didn't really exist for probably a hundred years after the death of Jesus. It was really a movement within Judaism that saw Jesus as the Messiah. By the way, the Messiah was not an unknown figure in Judaism. It had been referred to in the Old Testament in a number of books, so it wasn't an alien idea so much. <clears throat> uh, so people were quite comfortable in being Jewish and thinking there was a Messiah and yes, thinking that Jesus was that very Messiah. So we'll, we'll talk about that next week. <clears throat> then we'll talk about the early Christian church. Uh, the early Christian church, by the way, uh, was very different than what we understand today, borrowing many of the influences of the time to incorporate in, into its practices and into its beliefs, uh, some pagan ideas were infused into Christianity at the time. We'll talk more about that. I'm not suggesting these are wrong. I'm just saying this is what the history suggests. We'll talk about next next week. <clears throat> now we'll talk about the Church of Rome in the Middle Ages. By the way, the Church of Rome is distinct from the Eastern Church. There was a split uh, in about 400, 450 or so where the Eastern Church went one way and the Western Church went another. And uh, most of our conversation will be about the Western Church because the Reformation never existed in the Eastern Church. There's not a lot to talk about. So we'll talk about that. And then we'll talk about the Christian Church in America. By the way, we're talking about thousands of years of time that I'm scrunching into five separate pieces of information. So I'm going to fly at a high level and probably drop down instantly and then back up. So forgive me if I don't touch on everything you might expect, but it's a matter of putting together information that you can make sense of in a short period of time. Okay. So uh, 
a couple and of I just say that I'm excited about this current model. That's really good. Absolutely. Well, good. Good. Uh, actually, you get the college credit for this. Uh, yes, you yeah. do. Uh, I'll just sign whatever document you've got. It, it'll be fine. Uh, I should ask the question. I was going to save it for later, but your question uh, inspired me to ask this. Are there some things you'd like to hear about or know, given all the topics I talked about? Mm -hmm. uh, and by the way, this is not the only time I'll ask this question, mm -hmm. but let me know. Is there anything that you want to Yes. What year did the Romans take control of Judea? Uh, 63 BC. 63. Wow. We'll, we'll talk about timeline, by the way. I've got timelines and everything here. You'll, you'll love it. Um, and by the way, Palestine was not the first time it had been conquered, it, it'd been conquered uh, over a number of centuries. But nonetheless, uh, 63 is when Rome uh, took over BC. BC. BC, that's right. Or as they say, BCE before the Common Era. Well, let's start. Um, so, a, a couple of reflections, and I want to make sure that I'm clear. Um, does anybody know what a primary and a secondary source is? Primary source is like a diary or something where the person that was part of the action uh, took note of it. Secondary is like hearsay. Or um, you know, second or third generation that's right because yeah. Well, historians wouldn't want to be accused of writing hearsay, but uh, but you're right. Primary sources are contemporaneous. They uh, they occur at the time of the events. <clears throat> it could be coins. It could be legislation. It could be diaries. It could be accounts of one kind or another. Um, and historians consider those to be the most important source of historical truth is primary sources. Secondary sources are derivative, which is to say uh, they you look at the primary stuff and you write about it. And historians, of course, is all about secondary sources. Interestingly enough, the, in, the sources we have are uh, for Palestine at the time of Jesus, are uh, sort of uh, a hybrid, sort of primary and sort of secondary, which I'll get to in a second, which makes them problematic, by the way. It's hard to know exactly what is truth based on what we know from these primary slash secondary sources. Yes, okay. Pardon me? Yes. Yep. Right. And of course, many of them do not exist today or they're in bits and pieces. Um, there are some of those, that's for sure, but hardly enough to draw some conclusions, at least the conclusions we'd like to draw from them. Uh, but at least there's some confirmation of some of the opinions that people have about the uh, historical documents that remain today. Um, a little of what we know about the Hebrew Bible uh, and the New Testament, it's based on primary sources, but much is learned in conjecture, which is to say they'll look at something and they'll, it'll be a fragment and they'll maybe look at other historical documents or other references and make some opinions about what happened. So a lot of what we talk about, we can't prove beyond a shadow of a doubt, uh, but it is suggestive. And after all, that's what our faith is based on, is learned conjecture. Um, so we're left with confirming the Bible as a literal tooth, a truth or meaningful stories. Of course, there are people who believe that the Bible is literally true. <clears throat> and I don't deny that. Uh, on the other hand, it's hard to prove that what you believe is truth actually happened. So some people see the Bible as more of a metaphor or a set of stories that have meaning. To them. I must say I fall on that side of the interpretation, maybe because of my historical background. But nonetheless, uh, I'm not here to say that any one interpretation of the Bible is wrong. But the orientation you'll see today is of that kind, sort of a metaphor, historical uh, <clears throat> view of the Bible. John, yes. Nash, 
to those who see it as a literal truth, is that actually based on their opinion that it was divinely inspired? Yes. In terms of the right. Yes. And for years, <clears throat> for years, centuries really, the Bible was indeed interpreted as literal truth. <clears throat> Catholic Church saw the Bible, at least the Vulgate version, the Latin version of the Bible, as the truth, as scripture. And only uh, in the Reformation, and we'll talk more about that in uh, session four, only in the Reformation did people begin to, you know, to look at the Bible and try to understand what it's really saying. And academics began looking at the Bible saying, well, wh what is the background here? And what do we believe? And what do we think is simply a good story? Yes, sir. The first historians were really just reporters reporting on the, what was going on at the time, I think, right? You mean, uh, and back in that case, was they, well, they're reporting on what's there, happening. I mean, they're, they're there's like, only uh, one historian, if you want to use that term, called Osipas. Have you heard of him? Uh, he existed in year 100 or so, and he is probably the closest source we have to um, what was actually going on. And he took documents that existed at the time, legislation that existed at the time, court records that ex existed at the time, and put together a history. And, and we see both Josephus as, uh, sorry, Josephus as the primary historian for this time, even though he collected stuff that was probably uh, not all that representative of the time, but he's he's the best we got. Is he Jewish or Roman? He's a Roman. Roman, okay. Yeah, he did. Um, so, working principle of the course is that uh, whether true or not, literally true or not, the Bible still has spiritual meaning. I am not suggesting that with this look at history that we somehow diminish the importance of the message in the Bible. Please don't think that. But I'm what I'm trying to do, one of the interests I have in the story is to understand what people were like at a particular time. They're people like us. You know, they, they, they have the same, same DNA. But things were different. And so why were they why were they different? And how did that affect people? How did it affect the decisions they made and the culture they choose? And frankly, how does that inform us about what we are? Um, one of the things that I found interesting about studying the Bible is it helps me understand or examine my faith to understand better why I believe what I believe in the in the con context of history. And I hope you'll find this to be true for you today. Okay. <clears throat> so <clears throat> the Hebrew Bible, this is the Old Testament, was years in the making. Uh, it was a series of stories, a series of oral histories, uh, stories passed on generation from generation that were not necessarily documented, sometimes they were, but existed. And um, only during the Babylonian ca captivity, we'll talk more about that, did they begin taking all these stories and combining them and docu documenting them in what we know as the Old Testament. So that's one of the problematic aspects of this period, which is to say, these are not contemporaneous accounts. These are oral stories. These are histories passed on word by word, person by person, and eventually were documented. Are they true? Well, have you ever played telephone? <laughs> if you play telephone, you understand what it's like to, have, to repeat a story that you've heard and tell it to somebody else and have them tell it back to you and you'll find it's different. So I'm not suggesting, by the way, these are invalid. I'm just saying that there's always, there's a grain of truth in these stories. There's a grain of truth in this history, but uh, maybe not as accurate as we'd like it to be. Um, <clears throat> for 95% of the Jews during Roman rule, and by the way, this is true for the time before Roman rule, they existed to provide wealth and comfort for the top one or two percent. It was called a dominant economic model. It occurs, occurs today. 
It occurred, it occurred a lot during this period of time. It occurred throughout the Middle Ages. Wealth was a function of acquiring property and plunder. You acquired property, you initially had wealth, and you got whatever riches were available at the time. Uh, unfortunately, it was very difficult to hold on to this because warfare was what it was. So there's constant changes. Empires came, empires went, and we found the same thing to be true Palestine. Palestine was ruled by a variety of empires, all of which hewed to this dominant domination economic model, a cruel existence for those losers who were simply feeding wealth to the top 1%. Yes, sir. How, how did um, the Greek Empire transition into the Roman Empire? Was there a war? Hang on to that. I have a timeline. All right. Sorry. It's just, uh, a little bit. Okay. Um, Jewish social structure was very hierarchical. <clears throat> you had the winners, even within Jews. You had the winners and you had the losers. We'll talk more about what that meant. But Rome relied on a compliant upper aristocracy to help them rule. And that upper aristocracy was known as the Sadducees. Uh, I think if you read your New Testament, you'll see that term Sadducees. I'll explain more about that. But it was very hierarchical. And the people on the bottom lived a miserable existence. All they did was to work hard at agrarian functions. Uh, and they paid their taxes. Uh, they were lived a subsistence life in order for the wealthy to enjoy themselves. Um, <clears throat> we have very little contemporaneous uh, knowledge of Jesus and his life. I'll tell you what we know. I'll tell you what we assume. But we have very little. Um, <clears throat> and what we know of Jesus, the most contemporary documents we have, occurred anywhere from 40 to 80 years after his death. And this is through several generations of storytelling. So the gospels are what I call really faith narratives as opposed to histories. Not to saying there's some historical truth embedded in there, there is, but exactly what it was and what is a story, uh, hard to know. But we'll talk more about that as we flesh out the gospels. This will be next week. Yes, sir. A question for you. No. During that time, the Jewish church was very strong. There were these higher up, like you said, that kind of there. Now, did they kind of dictate what was transmitted down <laughs> to the common people? And how <clears throat> the answer is yes and no. Um, it's a favorite answer, by the way, historians. We say that all the time. Uh, yes, in the sense that uh, they were the authority for how life was lived as a Jew. And that came primarily from the Torah. Uh, no, in the sense that they were passing on whatever dictates Rome, Rome had. Uh, Jews collected taxes. Jews enforced Roman rule. Uh, so some of the Roman rule had nothing to do with the way people believed and lived their life. Some did. But the Sadducees were responsible for sorting through this and then essentially governing the rest of Palestine. It's a light word, by the way. It's hard to, we don't, government at this time was not what we know it today, but still uh, it was the Sadducees who were primarily responsible for that. Okay, here's the timeline I was telling you about. <clears throat> By the way, this is a testament to my PowerPoint skills. Uh, it's a little crude, I'm sorry, but okay. what, do I, what do I know? Um, so you can see 1200 BCE to 04 CE. 04 CE, by the way, is we think roughly the date of Jesus' birth, roughly. Um, <clears throat> so what happened? Well, Exodus. The flight from Egypt, it was, in fact, a true event. They were slaves, or I should say they were held in Egypt, and they were able to leave 
um, of course, through a covenant with God, through promises that they would live a godly life. And they, they left uh, and they wandered around for a period of 40 or 50 years. We'll talk more about this in, in when we talk about the books of the Torah. Uh, and then they established a tribal confederacy. This was the closest thing to the, quote, milk and honey promise of the Lord. Uh, it was a much more egalitarian life, not egalitarian life in the way we understand it, but certainly compared to the domination economic model that they had lived under in Egypt and would live, live under after the tribal confederacy. So this existed for several hundred years, but it's very hard, of course, to keep something like this in place without some king coming along and screwing things up. Uh, now, I'm not saying that uh, Saul and David and Solomon did that, but they did establish a, uh, a, uh, an autocracy, a monarchy. Uh, it was a benign monarchy, uh, written very lovingly in the Old Testament, <clears throat> but nonetheless, power started at the top. <clears throat> um, it didn't last long. And then the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom, these are two separate kingdoms, under a monarchical model, um, and uh, the northern kingdom covered what they call Israel. The second is, is Judah. By the way, these terms are still used today uh, to describe uh, Palestine, Israel. Um, so th these models existed for uh, several hundred years, uh, but the northern kingdom was... Uh, taken over by Assyria. The southern kingdom was taken over by the Babylonian Empire. Same economic model, just different guys leading it. Um, and um, as a result, and we don't know exactly why this has happened, but about 20% of the Palestinian population, the Jewish population, was taken to Babylon. We think, in part, it was the leaders. They didn't want the leaders hanging around, infecting everybody else. Maybe it may have been uh, work, slavery, we don't know. But a significant percentage of the population was taken over and taken to Babylon. They were busy when they, were, when they got there because they began compiling all these stories, <clears throat> all these, these ideas that have been passed down generation from generation and began documenting them in, <clears throat> into uh, documents. Uh, much of the New Testament, mm, the Torah, the prophets, the kings, were all compiled and documented during this period of time. It was a very important part of Jewish history. Um, and then <clears throat> they came back. They were, uh, th what happened was Babylon got taken over by the Persian Empire, Another another group uh, queuing to the same economic model, same life, same existence, just different heads. And uh, then the, the the Jews in Babylon were were allowed to return to Palestine, and they did so with these documents in hand. These now became part of the belief <clears throat> and the tradition <clears throat> of Jewish life. John, yes, sir. is it safe to say that Babylon, as we know it now, is Iraq yes. and Persia, yes, Iran, yes, right, yes. Okay, the Persian Empire, by the way, covered what we know now known as Iraq, but still, uh, much of what we know of of uh, life here centered in, uh, roughly in Damascus, Iraq, roughly. Uh, it's these historical terms are really hard to pin down because they're so vague and they occupy so much geography. It's very hard to know exactly what happened, but roughly that's the case. And empire was all a part of life. It was all a part of life then. It was a part of life probably up until the Industrial Revolution, where we found new ways to generate wealth. Sometimes unfair, but they were new and didn't rely on uh, the acquisition of land and plunder. Uh, the Hellenist Empire, this is Alexander the Great, 
And then finally, we're all, at the end, uh, there was a revolt against the, uh, against the Hellenist Empire, the Maccabees. This, again, was a return to the idea of a confederacy, which had existed centuries before, uh, didn't last long. And then Rome came in about 63. And that's the time we're talking about. Yes. Sir. And so if you were actually mapping, I'll call it the level of freedom that the that the Jewish people experienced, uh, you would actually have a, uh, someone who was spiked at the tribal confederacy and spike at the Maccabee, and everywhere else would be a troll of, of that, personal freedom. That, that, that's right. Now, I, I, I would create too much of a gap between one and the other, but if you were a Peasant, well, a peasant, and it probably didn't feel a lot different, but nonetheless, it was a little bit more egalitarian. That's that's correct. Yes, sir. Uh, don't the time of trees, uh, that's where the Jews get the celebration of Hanukkah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. That, this, by the way, occurred. Um, <clears throat> the, the the documents coming out of the Babylonian captivity were beginning to percolate and generate, and they were beginning to be shared. And a lot of what a lot of the rights of it came that existed at the time of Jesus, uh, the Hanukkah, the celebration of Passover, the importance of the temple came out of the experience from the Babylonian captivity. Also, also in Maccabees, <coughs> the documents an uprising against the Greeks. Yes. Yeah. Yes. It was uh, unexpected. By the way, uh, Rome was different in the sense that they had firm military control. A lot of these empires couldn't afford the military needed to maintain the geography. It was very expensive. So it was relatively easy to begin another empire sweeping in, taking over, and kicking the old empire out. I'm, I'm being a little uh, superficial, but still, that that's the model. Yes, ma'am. Um, I was kind of wondering whether in ancient times with nobody had nobody could read, were people able to use the part of their brain that we don't use any longer? That's a story. Uh, but, well, uh, let's put it this way. Um uh, hymns and stories were a very important part of culture. You you translated your feelings, your thoughts, your facts orally. And hymns were a very important part of that process. Psalms is a bunch of hymns. And that's the way they, they worshiped, was to sing and to share stories. And yeah, you're right. A certain, a certain amount of the brain is capable of uh, what improving on that. If, if, if certain the part that, that responded to the written word wasn't really developed that much, if that's what you're trying to get at. Yeah. Yes. I remember hearing that the Psalms um, had titles, not numbers. Mm -hmm. they, they, they're like song yeah. titles. Yeah. All uh, this is the Old Testament and the New Testament, all the books and the verses were applied later. They didn't write number. This is first book. This is the second book. They were just documents. And to make sense of it, they began breaking them down into books and verses. So yeah, that's that's right. There's a lot of things that we did to the Bible, <laughs> which which weren't necessarily true at the beginning. At the end of the Babylonian captivity, did that have anything to do? Well, was there any reconstitution of Israel or is it just lost at the end of the northern kingdom. The northern kingdom and the southern kingdom were gone. <clears throat> um, but the, the, the people, the, the people, the people who had been there, many, many of them were were sent to Assyria. In, in, in the Babylonian captivity. No, at the at the end of the northern kingdom, when Assyria conquered the northern kingdom. Yeah, they were just they were just incorporated. They didn't go anywhere. They were just incorporated, and they and they lived pretty much as they lived under the old empire. Uh, the Babylonian captivity was unique in the sense that people were actually picked, selected, and dragged to another location. 
Question about Bible, Bible means very cultured and very sophisticated. What did they have those leaders and what they brought back from the standpoint of the heart? Yeah, we, we don't know. We don't There's know. nothing in the Old Testament that suggests influences from Babylon. That's not to say they didn't exist, we, but we just don't know. It's one of the mysteries that we have in the historical record. The what? The, the papal states. Oh, oh, that's later. Right? Much, much later. It was more of a political decision. We'll talk more about that okay. when we get to the Middle Ages. Uh, yes. Uh, I, the reason for the, the Jews to rebel against the Greeks was because the Greeks tried to intrude on their religion change it. Was that true? Uh, no. Uh, well, the, 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 the Greeks had an influence on the, the Jews that nobody liked. The, the big reason is because the Hellenist Empire couldn't maintain the military strength to keep the area under control. Uh, Rome was unique in that they were able to, to fund a military for hundreds of years they ran out of funding, by the way. It's one of the reasons why the Roman Empire failed. But they were able to maintain that military strength in part because they could afford it, in part because every area was essentially co-run by designated local people. They were part of the governmental structure. Uh, it was a unique thing. Rome did a good job, at least in terms of maintaining control. <clears throat> I'm sorry, I'm going to have to rush through. Uh, I'm, I'm running out of time. Um, so we've already made these points. Um, uh, it's, it, it's this historical context that inspired much of the Hebrew Bible. And the Old Testament, by the way, was essentially a primer, if you will, of what people believed <clears throat> themselves to be like and the values that they had. And we'll talk a lot about that in the next uh, section. I'm going to break the, the Old Testament down into big chunks. One is the Torah, or the Pentateuch, or the five books of Moses. <clears throat> and these were, these are not alien to you, uh, the Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. At a very high level, each one of these books dis were described as, as I have them. Uh, Genesis was a series of origin stories. How did the Jews become the Jews? Uh, what, what role did God play in the formation of Judaism? And what role did God play in the covenant between Jews and God? And all these stories are circulated within Genesis. Exodus, the escape from Egypt. I don't have to tell you much about that. A lot was uh, written about that. That's all a big story. Uh, Leviticus was a series of laws and rules that Jews were expected to live by as a part of the covenant. There were 613 of these guys. They were all, there were a lot um, down to very minutiae things like what you could eat and where you could go and what you could stay, say. If you well, take a look at Leviticus, if you want to get a sense of what of the detail of these codes, that's all about it. Numbers was an account of the 40 years, you know, of, the, of wandering. Uh, Moses was, uh, was there. He got the, the uh, Ten Commandments and uh, everybody was waiting. Uh, sometimes they misbehaved, and there were stories about misbehavior. Sometimes God forgave them, sometimes he didn't. But all these stories were in that are part of, of numbers. And then Deuteronomy is, is Moses' final speech. And Moses never made it to the promised land. He never made it to the land of milk and honey. So these are stories of the Jews, their beginning, their trials, their covenant with God, and finally their release in the form of what we'll call a confederacy or the land of milk and honey. Um, <clears throat> as I said, they were composed over several centuries from several sources. They were completed during the Babylonian kept, 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 captivity. They described God's promise to lead the Jews from a life of dominance to a new, more egalitarian world. <clears throat> and for the Sadducees, 
we'll talk more about this, for the Sadducees, the Torah was it. Prophets, less important. The Torah was the way you lived. And it imposed on the Jewish community a very strict set of guidance and rules about how you lived your life and what you should believe and how you should be uh, how you should uh, worship God. Um, <clears throat> so that's the that's the uh, Pentateuch. Hey John, it was also my understanding that Leviticus actually created the cottage industry of of the. Um, uh, of the Jewish clergy to to regulate uh, in that life, and that's why if you look at the Jewish clergy pyramid is much much larger than it is in, in many other. Oh yeah. Yeah, 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 well that's that's right. But still, they they were the they were the bosses. Right. And uh, I, I, have you ever seen uh, the film The Chosen? Yes. Um, it I, I wouldn't say it's. <clears throat> Dead on accurate, but it does fairly, fairly represent the influence and authority of the Sadducees, of the leaders. Um, they were part of the governance structure. They made sure that order was there, and Rome depended on them to make sure that order was there. <clears throat> Next, the prophets. Um, these are divided into two big groups. One is the former pro prophets. These are the historical uh, books. Uh, all this, the kings. Joshua, Judges, all of the histories that you see, if you read about, are located in these books. And they form the basis for the prophets, which are the second set. <clears throat> There's the later, latter prophets, which are, consist of uh, the major prophets like Jer Isaiah and Jeremiah. And the, the message surrounded the themes of the majesty of the Lord. A lot of what is contained in prophets <clears throat> had to do with messages about domination, about fairness, and about how one needed to, to fight against this kind of unfair control. And I'll read for you a couple examples of that. <clears throat> now, this comes from Amos. Uh, you probably can't read it. I'll read it for you, if you don't mind. It says, do your rulers in Jerusalem and in the city of Samaria feel safe and at ease? Everyone bows down to you, and you think you're better than any other nation, but you're in trouble. You are cruel, and you forget the coming day of judgment. You rich people lounge around on beds with ivory posts while dining on the meat of your lambs and calves. You sing foolish songs to the music of liars, and you make up new tunes, just as David used to do, so you'll be the first <clears throat> dragged off as captives, wow. and your good times will end. Wow. That's in Amos. <clears throat> Watch out. <clears throat> and if that wasn't enough, <clears throat> he also goes on to say, I, the Lord, hate and despises your religious celebrations and your times of worship. I won't accept your offering or sacrifice, not even your very best. No more of your noisy songs. I won't listen to when you when you play your harps, but let justice and fairness flow like a river that never runs dry. I mean, <clears throat> that's powerful stuff. <clears throat> and mind you, by the way, these words were a part of what people heard at the time of Jesus. There was a sense that we're not being treated fairly that things are wrong. This is not God's will. Now, there wasn't a lot they could do about it, but nonetheless, it created a kind of culture of awareness that things should not be the way they are. So uh, that's the prophets. Uh, <clears throat> now, um, uh, the, the, the latter prophets, and this is Isaiah, were also uh, providing guidance about what the Babylonian captivity meant and what happens with the return to uh, Palestine. <clears throat> and the message here is, be brave. Don't worry. You have truth. You have God's will. Go to Jerusalem and live the way God wants you to do. And here's a, a quote from Isaiah. Our God has said, encourage my people. Give them comfort. <clears throat> Speak kindly to them and announce your slavery is past. Your punishment is over. 
clear a path in the desert, in the desert, flatten every hill and mountain, level rough and rugged ground, then the glory of the Lord will appear for all to see. There is good news for the city of Zion. Shout it as loud as you can from the highest mountain. Your God is here. The Lord cares for his nation, just as shepherds do for their flocks. These were inspiring words that people, by the way, remember because it was part of the prophets, part of the Old Testament. Now, remember, Sadducees downplayed this part of the Old Testament, but not the Pharisees. And we'll talk more about who they were in a minute or two. But there was a cadre, a very influential cadre of Jews that believed in the messages coming out of the prophets. And believed that this was a this was a, a an endpoint that people should begin thinking about and working toward. It was also uh, messages about Messiah. In Isaiah again, my servant suffered and endured great pain for us. He was painfully abused, but he did not complain. He was condemned his death without a fair trial. His life was taken away because of the sinful things that many people had done. He was buried in a tomb of cruel and rich people. The Lord decided his servant would suffer as a sacrifice to take away the sin and guilt of others. Who does this sound like? This was in Isaiah. And further, he pointed out in, in an earlier chapter, a virgin is pregnant. They have a son and will name him Emmanuel. Even before the boy's old enough to choose between right and wrong, the countries of the two kings you fear will be destroyed. Now, some Christians see this, some Jews see this as a harbinger of the coming Christ. It's important to know, by the way, that nobody saw, nobody anticipated Jesus at this time. Yes, they anticipated the Messiah, and that Messiah would come and bring freedom and hope to people, but not specifically Jesus. Um, at the time of Jesus, we'll talk more about this, there were a lot of Jesus figures out there. He wasn't the only one. There was a lot of people claiming that they were bringing God's word and performing miracles, much as what was mentioned in, in, uh, in the Old Testament in Isaiah. Just want you to know this was the context for what people believed at the time in Palestine, and what it made such an interesting part of the experience, and by the way, what give resonance to Jesus' teaching. If you didn't have something like this, the question is would Jesus had ever had the impact that he would have had these documents not existed? It's important we all, okay? How, how are we coming here? Are we okay? Yes. Yeah, uh, uh, 10 minutes. 10 minutes? Okay. Uh, I'll go through these very quickly. These are the wisdom. These are the wisdom books. <clears throat> these are Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Psalms, Job, etc. They are more focused on the individual. Uh, the Pharisees found them much more relevant to their life. And and by the way, a lot of what you read in in the wisdom books are what Jesus taught, what Jesus said. So a lot of what he said came from the wisdom books. Here's an example: I am wisdom. Common sense is my closest friend. I possess knowledge and sound judgment. If you respect the Lord when you hate, well, uh, when you hate evil, I have pride and conceit and deceitful lies. I am strong and offer sensible advice and sound judgment. By my power, kings govern and the rulers make laws that are fair. Every honest leader rules with help from me. I love everyone who loves me, and I will be found by all who honestly search. What you, what you receive from me is more valuable than even the finest gold or purest silver. Does this sound like something Jesus would say? Well, yeah. So a lot of what Jesus said came directly from Proverbs. Now, I'm not saying he quoted them, but these were, this is still an oral tradition. The, the Old Testament was not read. It was shared through stories. And a lot of what Jesus said I'm sure it was in the air, if you will, and people had a receptive audience to some of the lessons that he, he gave them. Uh, I'm not going to have time to finish everything, but I'm going to rush through this if I can. Here's Palestine. <clears throat> it's an actual map. 
And by the way, Jews today still, you can't see this real time. Uh, they still talk about Samaria and Judea as parts of Palestine, parts of Israel. Uh, they, it's geographical locations coming directly from Palestine as we knew it then. Um, 63, Rome conquered Palestine, governed through a series of client rulers. <clears throat> uh, in 37 BC, Rome appointed Herod the Great, who was a Jew, as one of the client rulers. And they liked Herod. He brought order to the place. Taxes were collected. Passover occurred without a lot of problems. They liked him. He was also an observant Jew, and he believed that part of his job was to rebuild Jerusalem in a manner that befitted the glory of Jerusalem. So it was a tremendous building campaign, one of which included the new temple. This cost money. So in addition to Roman taxation, there was also the tax taxation from Herod's building program. And you can imagine what additional privation this visited upon those poor agricultural workers as they were trying to get through the day and pay their taxes. Um, <clears throat> Oh, we already made this point. John? Yeah. I hate to divert, but to that point, even before when you were explaining taxes, the census, was it the Sadducees that did that? Um, how, you know, if you have these um, peasants, if you know, who kept track? Like somebody's born, somebody's a working age. Um, how did taxes get collected? For this popular right. well, one of the things I didn't mention, uh, one of the things that Rome brought to its governance model was administration. There were records. They knew who paid their taxes and they know who did. And the reason they knew is because they employed Jews to collect the taxes for them. Uh, the, 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 the tax was tax obligation was given to the tax collector. The tax collector would collect taxes many more than the obligation because hey, they get, had to get paid, right? So that's why they were hated so much because not only did they collect taxes, they got their fair share. Uh, well, sorry. Let's go on here. Mm -hmm. Um, so Herod died in 1 CE, and there was a series of replacement rulers that didn't do a very good job. Uh, and Rome did not like that. So, in effect, what they had was a Roman to finally come in and rule Palestine, Pontius Pilate. We're all familiar with him. So, unlike a client ruler, it was a Roman who was responsible for the governance of Palestine. Um, and he continued the practice of, uh, of brutality. Now, uh, uh, this is probably worth it. <clears throat> this is a representation of the temple. <clears throat> um, and it doesn't include <clears throat> the, uh, the Hall of the Gentiles. The Hall of the Gentiles surrounded the temple. And it's, it essentially it was a street fair. It was a bunch of people <clears throat> selling food during Passover, but also selling animals for sacrifice. And you couldn't uh, you couldn't buy an animal for sacrifice unless you changed your money for temple money. And that's where the money changers came in. And of course, they got their piece of the action as well. So <clears throat> you had all these people surrounding the uh, the, the temple, food. Clothing, animals for sacrifice. It was a real bazaar. Uh, but inside uh, was the called so called women's court. This is the way they described it. These were Jews, men and women, that were allowed inside the temple uh, for worship. Um, but what, what really went on was the sacrifice that occurred in the man's court. Men only. You brought your animal in for sacrifice, and they sacrificed it then and there. 
it was a bloody mess. I mean, they, they actually killed these poor animals. Uh, if you were poor, you brought a dove. If you are wealthy, you brought a calf or whatever. But still, there was all this bloodshed involved in a man's court. Um, uh, the, the, the priest's court were there as a part of the, sacra the sacrament and the, uh, the, uh, the ceremony. Uh, and, and inside this tall structure here was where the Holy of Holies, the Ark, resided. And there the head priest would go and honor God over the Ark. Um, these were, the, the temple existed uh, from the time of, of uh, it, it, it pre-existed uh, uh, Herod, but it became a, an area of splendor under his rule, and it attracted more and more people. Interestingly enough, right next to the uh, temple was a tall building where the Roman guard was housed. Why? Because the Passover was a messy affair. Lots of people, and they wanted to make sure that things were in order. Now, what better way to assure that people were in order was to have a garrison of Roman troops right next to the temple to make sure everything was okay. You can imagine what people must have felt like as they worshipped at the temple. Five minutes, John. Five minutes? Oh, man, it's going to be tough. Um, um, yeah, let, so here are the groups. Sadducees, strict followers of the Torah, we already mentioned this, a priestly class responsible for the temple rituals and heavily dependent on Rome to maintain the traditions of the temple. Uh, many Jews resented the Sadducees, as you can imagine. Then you had the Pharisees. These were more, uh, th th these, th these were people who saw value not just in the Torah, but in, in, the, in the rest of the Bible, in the prophets, the message, the egalitarian message, the message of the covenant of God, this the the wisdom of of the wisdom books. Uh, Jesus was probably a Pharisee, or at least he acted and behaved like a Pharisee. Uh, we'll talk next week about why the Pharisees were were derided as such despicable beings. That has more to do with the time that uh, that the scripture was written. But nonetheless, the Pharisees were much more broadly open-minded about what it meant to be Jewish and how you lived a Jewish life. The Essenes, you've probably heard of them. They, they were off in the mountains. They were essentially hermits that were, that were trying to protect the, 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 the truth and the value of, 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 uh, of the, the Torah and, and the Old Testament. And then finally, the Zealots. The Zealots were real. They were a threat. They were like the ISIS of the time. Uh, they were constantly looking for ways to challenge Rome. And, uh, and, and of course, it's the context for what how Jesus was treated. He's, he's preaching sedition, this guy. He's not a whole lot different from the other guy that knifed the Roman uh, uh, soldier. He's a threat. So it's this structure which helps under helps you describe what was going on at the time. Um, I have a couple of videos I'd like you to see, but this is what we know of the historical Jesus. <clears throat> um, he was a Jew, preaching Judaism to Jews. That's what he was doing. Not Christianity, Judaism, as he saw it, as it was interpreted in the Old Testament. Uh, he began a Jewish movement, the goal of which was to establish the kingdom of God. What was that? We don't know. It could be that his message was highly seditious, and he was talking about replacing the current Roman Empire. It could be they were talking about this idea of the kingdom of God as separate from that of Caesar's. It's hard to know because the descriptions of the kingdom of God were written in scriptures 50 to 80 years later, and they were very worried about writing something that Rome wouldn't like. So they were described. They, they were just they were describing sort of a um, gentler version of of Jesus' message. Whether that was true or not, we don't know. But he was clearly talking about something that was separate from or a challenge to Roman Empire. And for this, he was tried 
and he was punished. That's what we know of Jesus. Um, I, I, I'm sorry, I don't have time to do this. Rich tells me. I'll, I'll stop, Rich. Um, these, uh, I'll show them next time. These two videos talk about what we've been able to deduce about Jesus. Turns out, according to the research, according to the scholarly work, Jesus was not illiterate. He was not poor. He may have been a part of what was then just roughly described as the middle class. And he lived right near a major Roman city where he probably went early on for employment or for learning or for whatever. He wasn't out in the boonies. Sephora is the name of the city. He lived near four miles away from Sephora. And so Jesus was not quite the poor itinerant creature that he's described in the, in the scripture. Uh, a very magnetic personality. Don't get me wrong, but still not quite the illiterate peasant that he's described in the common understanding of Jesus. Yes. Were the synagogues used as like schools for children to learn? Synagogues? <laughs> no. No. Uh, learning was not a part. You learn. You, you, you were at the top of, of the hierarchy when you learned. And you essentially told people what they should think. Other than that, there weren't schools as we as we know them today. Uh, this uh, I understand. Uh, Reza Islam had been here. Is that this is a video of Reza Islam? Uh, Reza Islam, by the way, is an Iranian. He's he he was converted to Christianity. He converted back to his, to Muslim to Islam. So he's kind of an interesting chapter in history. Uh, but he does provide an interesting perspective on Jesus and what he may have meant to people and uh, an explanation for why people believed in Jesus and his resurrection. It's not necessarily that it happened. It was that it was a story about what happened. And I I'm not here to tell you what's right or wrong. I'm just saying this is part of, of the video that you'll see next time if we have time.